from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Americans are stepping up to fight the coronavirus by revving up their sewing machines, changing what they produce. While farm country continues to feel the financial impact. I think we'll see some ethanol plants closed. And Congress works to bring relief. I thought we were on the five yard line. Right now, we're on the two. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. President Trump is looking into the idea of loosening restrictions placed on the country because of the coronavirus, saying he hopes to have the country opened up by Easter. Meanwhile, top congressional and White House officials negotiating a nearly $2 trillion virus rescue package. They say a deal appears to be at hand. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer say they spoke by phone with President Donald Trump as they met late into Monday night at the Capitol. U.S. stock futures rising on Tuesday on hopes of the deal. The massive Senate package is a far-reaching effort to prop up the U.S. economy, help American households, and bolster the health care system amid the growing crisis. It also includes up to $50 billion to farmers through the Commodity Credit Corporation. That's the account USDA has used in the past to make trade aid payments. The deal with the CCC would also provide aid to livestock producers. I just finished a very productive meeting with Secretary Mnuchin, the White House Congressional Liaison Eric Uland, and Mark Meadows, the President's Acting Chief of Staff. Last night, I thought we were on the five-yard line. Right now, we're on the two. We are close to a bill that takes our bold Republican framework, integrates further ideas from both parties, and delivers huge progress on each of the four core priorities <clears throat> I laid out a week ago. New York Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer says a key provision in the emerging package would provide for four months of salary for workers furloughed because of the pandemic. National Beef is the latest packer saying it will help cattle producers through this crisis. Drovers reporting National Beef has told cattle feeders it will pay $113 for all cattle bought last week regardless of the negotiated price. The news comes after Tyson Foods announced it would add $5 per hundred weight to live cattle. Both announcements sent the livestock markets much higher on Tuesday. So not all of the pot processors are participating. Uh, some of them have decided to cut the price of the beef going out the back door to their retailers to help those retailers uh, fill those empty shelves that I'm sure everyone has seen by now. Uh, the difference is that some uh, ground beef is priced at $7.50 in locations, a mm. similar product priced at $4.50 a pound. So a big difference there and a difference in the way these processors are, are handling this problem. And we're hearing from several other sectors of the ag industry facing economic challenges from the virus, including the ethanol industry and corn growers. One of the nation's largest ethanol producers, Poet, saying it is stopping buying corn at some of its facilities. Poet says experts are projecting a 900 57 million gallon drop in ethanol demand from this month through May, adding up to 331 million bushels lost in corn demand. I think we'll see some ethanol plants close. The question will be, is that for a month? Is it for two months? Is it throughout the summer driving season? Uh, I, I think that those are the big unknowns, but it wouldn't surprise me to see some ethanol plants either slow or shut down production with the fall in gasoline demand. The Renewable Fuels Coalition is launching a campaign calling for the EPA not to appeal a court decision regarding biofuel waivers. Now, earlier this year, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 10th Circuit ruled exemptions granted to three refineries overstepped the EPA's authority because those refiners had not previously been granted waivers. The coalition saying between the virus, trade disputes, and the small refinery exemptions, now is not the time for the Trump administration to take any action that would cause further pain for ethanol producers or the farmers that supply them. For the dairy industry, more buys at the grocery store likely won't be enough to offset losses as the world economy slows. The National Milk Producers Federation forecasting losses over the last five weeks to be $2.85 billion. In a letter to Ag Secretary Purdue, NMPF made several requests, including additional dairy product purchases, compensation for milk disposal, and reopening sign-up for the Dairy Margin Coverage Program. NMPF said participation declined in 2020 because of forecasts for higher prices that have been radically revised due to the coronavirus. 
And it's not just dairy, meat and bread flying off the grocery store shelves. Wholesale egg prices are on the rise. USDA releasing its National Shell Egg Index Prices Report. And those prices are up in some cases by almost 300%. That's compared to a few weeks ago. The East Coast now seeing some of that springtime rain. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen joins us with the latest. Yeah, we had a fair amount of rain, especially in the southeastern U.S. over the past 24 hours. And you can see as we head into the next 24 hours, that's just going to be spreading more so into the mid-Atlantic states. So kind of wet in the east central United States. And we'll start to see some more rain and even a few flakes across the north central United States as well. All right, switching gears. More and more producers are calving, but some say they need better conditions. Jason Jacob of Rockville, Nebraska, sending us this picture. Now he's calving on his operation, and he says that his area had some snow late last week. Now conditions are not the greatest, being wet, foggy, and muddy. Sunshine is needed for calving, calving to run smoothly. Coming up in just a few minutes, we'll take a look at that national forecast. Clinton. Now to the health aspects of all of this and the concern about rural hospitals. How are they handling this? Rural hospitals often don't have the funding and supplies that hospitals in bigger cities do. I spoke with Alan Morgan of the National Rural Health Association. He warns hundreds of rural hospitals will need help. Um, we're seeking direct uh, cash payments to these rural facilities. The problem is um, more than half of them were losing money before this and now they've cleared out their beds in anticipation for these cases. So a lot of these rural hospitals are facing a significant cash crunch right now. We need to get the money out there so they can keep their doors open, number one. And then what Congress is looking at in this uh, package right now is a, a, a fund to be able to distribute across the United States. And in addition to that, some long-term payment increases just to make sure over the course of this next year, you will always have an emergency room available there in your community when you need it. Now, rural hospitals often rely on elective surgeries and physical therapy in order to meet costs. But federal leaders have asked hospitals to stop all non-emergency surgeries. And he says there's hope the stimulus package could include funding and equipment for these rural hospitals. On the health front, Anheuser-Busch now joining the list of companies making hand sanitizer. The company tweeting out, quote, we have a long history of supporting our communities and employees. This time is no different. That's why we're using our supply and logistics network to begin producing and distributing bottles of hand sanitizer to accommodate the growing needs across the United States, end quote. The company is saying it would be working with the Red Cross to determine where the sanitizer would be needed the most. Sanitizer has been in strong demand across the country since the coronavirus outbreak began. Coming up, we continue our focus on the ethanol industry right now and whether China could help offset some of those big losses. And later, efforts on the home front to help those fighting the virus on the front lines by doing a little crafting. A record surge in beef prices led the commodities markets on Tuesday. Prices at their highest level since 2017. Here's more from a market watcher with the CME. Lean hogs today up three and a half percent in change, um, getting a good little bounce here. We have also seen a bump, obviously, from the cattle market with uh, Tyson giving a one-off uh, payment to, to producers in the, in the cattle market. So we've got some spillover of that good feeling kind of going higher uh, with lean hogs, too. So the cattle market has also helped drag up some of the hog prices as well. And then lastly, you know, we've got a lot of front end demand, right? Everybody ran to the stores and we got this lockdown, right? Well, I'm locked down here too. And everybody went out to the stores. There was a lot of front loaded demand. Uh, shortages were out there. So that's also part of this move. Um, we'll see if we can keep that going. I think that's going to be interesting. Corn kind of trying to get up off its knees after the recent drubbing is taking following that oil market lower. Um, we've also seen May corn kind of climb back 38% of their 2020 range. Um, that could mean we're, hey, we've got some technical indicators telling us that we might be off to the races there. So that would be good too. All in all, um, in the face of things, it's good to see corn higher on the day. Ted Seifert was Interag Hedge, our guest today. Uh, Ted, let's talk about this ethanol market because that's been something to watch. And on the corn side of things, that, that is a real demand concern for folks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, you know, ethanol's probably been the biggest casualty here over the last two weeks because of the coronavirus scare. The fact that we are being, you know, we're, we're stuck in, indoors. We're, we're at home. We're not driving as much. We're not taking public transportation. We're not flying. 
So the energy markets as a whole have taken a big hit. But on top of that, throw Saudi Arabia and Russia having a price war and really involving us with that, too. That's been a big problem. Crude oil hitting lows that we haven't seen since 2001. And that is a big problem for ethanol. It's a big problem for the Brent, for the blend if we're not using the unleaded gasoline gallons. So you get ethanol plants that are talking about shutting down. You've seen corn bases drop dramatically over the past five days or so. That has been the biggest single uh, mm. fundamental factor in the corn market here this past week. So it's a concern. Uh, and what, what has to happen to get that to turn around? I, I don't know. Um, at some point, we will move past this. Right now, it doesn't feel like two weeks is going to be the time frame. So it is a concern, and that's a concern that's going to stick around for the corn market for a while. The only thing that would really offset that would be China coming in and buying that excess ethanol and making profit margins better again mm. and getting the ethanol machine rolling again. But until something like that happens, the ethanol industry has a problem here. Corn demand for ethanol has a problem here. And that's something that's going to be sort of the black cloud hanging over corn here for the next couple of months, hopefully, or I, I hope not, but that's the concern that we have. Yeah, you know, as we talk about that, obviously we have had some sales to China, but boy, we'd have to move quite a bit of corn to offset that though, wouldn't we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and not just corn, because we have the corn. It's a matter of we need to move ethanol in order to get the ethanol machine ramped up again. Okay. You know, because that is a, a massive chunk of our domestic demand. It's roughly half of our domestic demand. Um, so, yes, we need to export corn. We need to export more corn to hit the USDA's current target. So we need those sales, too. But let's get some ethanol moving. Right. Really, I, we know China needs that. It'd be great for them to come in and buy it. Corn's going to have that black cloud hanging over it until we fix the ethanol industry. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. Appreciate it as always, Ted. Thanks so much. We'll be back with more Ag Day coming up in just a minute. For professional marketing advice specifically tailored to your needs, call Zaner Ag Hedge at 312-277-0113. You can't afford to invest a dollar if you're not sure you'll get $2 back. Every 360 Yield Center product can do that. Find out how at 360ROICalculators.com. We're starting off with some wet weather in a lot of the eastern part of the country, especially in the mid-Atlantic states with a low pressure system that is going to be pulling off the coast. High pressure kind of keeping things drier for the far northeast. We're going to watch another slow moving front that's going to be bringing some rain and a few flakes to parts of the upper Midwest and into the northern plains back out into the west as well. Let's put this into motion. You can see what is going on and we do have that low pressure moving off. We'll still see a bit of rain in in the East Central United States, that's all starting to pull off as we get into the overnight hours, but we watch this low pressure starting to pick up a little bit more moisture. We're going to see rain, maybe a few flakes as we get into parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Great Lakes area, and we're going to see some unsettled weather in much of the West as well as in the form of rain and upper elevation snow. We start to dry out for a bit as we get into the next couple of days then as high pressure settles into the southeast, but we'll start to see that rain and few flakes moving into the eastern parts of the Great Lakes and we'll see continued scattered rain and snow showers in much of the West. Heading through the day on Thursday, the low continues to move east, but notice the rest of the front doesn't make a lot of movement. So we'll start to build more moisture into the plains, into the upper Midwest and into the Great Lakes right along and especially to the north of this cold front. So as far as how much precipitation the past 24 hours, really the focus has been in the southeastern United States. That low is going to be moving offshore, but it'll still be dumping some rain and some showers and thunderstorms moving through there and then they can see the addition of that front picking up more moisture, especially in the upper Midwest and into the Great Lakes area. Looking at our snowfall, most of that has been in the higher elevations in the west. But when you put on the next 24 hours, you start to see a few spots, especially as you get into some of the northern plains, starting to pop up with a little bit of snow. But look at these temperatures, extremely warm. Now it's cooler than yesterday in parts of the north central United States, but we're dealing with near 90 degrees down in southern Texas while we're in the 30s in the north central United States. Overnight, we're going to see those low temperatures really mild along the south and not not too bad for considering this time of the year all across the northern tier of states. Tomorrow we're going to see temperatures not quite as warm, but still a big swath of above normal temperatures in much of the southeastern United States. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. 
Swallow, Utah, cooler with some rain and snow showers today with a high of 46 degrees. Sparrow, Missouri, mostly sunny and warmer for you with a high of 69. And the same goes for Blue Jay, Ohio, mostly sunny and warmer with a high of 63. Well, some areas of the country are concerned about the potential for more flooding this spring. Other portions of the country are wondering whether they will have enough water this year as we continue our special report, Weathering the Storm, next. Weathering the Storm, brought to you by Pivot BioProven, the nitrogen producing microbes that stay put, whether or not. More than one third of the country's vegetables and two thirds of the country's fruits are produced in California. While growers faced water and drought problems in the past, they say there's a bigger scare ahead of them, which could potentially jeopardize production, leave more than a million acres fallow. Ag Day National reporter Betsy Gibbon continues our series on how farmers are weathering the storm. Spring is an important time for crops in Fresno County, California. That's your uh, potential almond right there. Trees have bloomed since then in this highly productive county. Even though it's a desert, growers here produce more than 350 types of crops. So we rely upon a water supply coming from outside of this immediate area to be able to feed everything that we see around here. Some of the water almond grower Ryan Jacobson depends on comes from snowpack on the Sierra Nevada mountains, which this year hasn't been much. Our statewide snowpack is currently at 46% of average. Nearly half of the state is under a moderate drought, which is higher than a year ago. However, those water issues could be more significant because of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which was signed into state law and then went into effect this year. Sigma is a 20 year state plan designed to manage California's groundwater resources. Some believe it could take away viable cropland. I love this time of year. I mean, Jacobson's area is fortunate enough to have surface water available, but every operation is different. It's going to force farmers to either A, try to find other ways to bring in additional water supplies, or B, you got to tremendously cut back in some areas um, your usage of groundwater. They believe it will put more pressure on growers to leave land fallow or take it out of production. There could be anywhere from 500,000 to about a million acres fallowed uh, because of Sigma. Grimway Farms is considered the largest carrot producer in the world. Its president, Jeff Huckabee, says its location is ideal. Kern County is, it is the hub for carrots in the entire nation. But Sigma is impacting carrot production and acreage. But we have growers in every water district around, so some are saying, hey, I'm probably not going to have a lot of extra acres to grow carrots in the future. I've got a lot of trees or vines or things that I need to protect. And if I do get cut, I'm taking care of those first. Even though Sigma pertains to groundwater, the whole water situation is complicated, and that includes surface water. California has both a federally controlled and state controlled surface water system. In many cases, they actually share infrastructure. There are several pending lawsuits over these H2O laws, and the state of California is suing the federal government to prevent implementing its new biological opinion, which could change those laws. Of old science, obsolete studies, and overbearing regulations that had not been updated in many, many years. Environmentalists and others say water needs to be managed with these different rules as to not deplete supplies and to protect endangered species such as native fish. Some farmers allege they've implemented changes in the past and it has not made a difference in helping those endangered species. Growers in some of the most productive land hope the act does not swallow water supply or their production. When you look at the acreage and the volume that we do, it's feeding the entire nation. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Betsy Gibbon. Coming up, a little cloth, some cotton, and a little work. We'll tell you about a grassroots effort to keep healthcare workers safe next. Lots of people are doing what they can to help healthcare workers who are right now on the front lines fighting the virus. Many are turning to their sewing machines while they're stuck at home and they're making homemade masks. We've seen reports of volunteers across the country forming sewing groups to make them, including a lot of 4-H'ers. Even Joanne Fabrics releasing this tutorial showing folks how to do it. And now a coalition of America, apparel brands, and textile companies are also turning their production to making medical face masks. 
familiar names like Hanes Brands and Fruit of the Loom, usually competitors, now banding together to make these masks. The company started production on Monday, and we're told they'll start making their first deliveries already this week. And that's all the time we have this morning. Sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us. From all of us here at AgDay, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.